sort of give me give you a very short version of my public lecture because we've got many other things to do today. What's our time allocation? Just again, uh, Maggie. We have until noon. Until noon. So sure. okay, about half an hour. That's good. So let's see if the uh, computer will actually play onto the screen. We got the projector turned on somewhere. The computer thinks there's a projector from the beginning to the end. <laughs> And uh, right up front, I want to confess that as far as I can tell, there is not really a beginning. <laughs> and there's not really an end, so I already lied. Uh, but why do I say there's not a beginning? Uh, because at least in physics, we don't have a way in which nothing can turn into something. We only have a way of describing uh, material turning to, uh, into other material. So um, that's our challenge to uh, think about this. Looks like things are coming along. So, um, I'd like also to put this in a cultural perspective. Uh, Jefferson wrote about the laws of nature and of nature's God in our Declaration of Independence. And he wrote about these truths that we hold to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and so forth. And I think um, I've been a very curious person ever since I was a little boy. I asked my dad, where did we come from? How did we get here? And um, we're beginning to answer some of that question because we do the physics part and we can begin to learn about how life might occur and we begin to learn the history of the Earth. Uh, but now I say, well, there's still a big challenge at the end when you get to people and how do they get to be able to say that? So I'm not going to answer that question. But uh, I do want to show you some of the questions that NASA was up to uh, in 1985. Uh, we had to explain to Congress why we needed to build four great observatories which were the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer Space Telescope, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, because all of these things were not known yet. And uh, we have made a lot of progress on these. How did the universe begin? Well, of course, already in the question, there's an implication that it did begin. And I'm asserting that it didn't really begin. It's just a change of one material into another. Um, will we find new laws of physics that govern cosmic evolution? We have indeed. We found dark matter. We found dark energy. And we think we found inflation. So indeed, we have three stunning discoveries that uh, certainly were not really expected in 1985 by most people. Um, how did the galaxies form? We knew in 1985 what we thought, and it was wrong. <laughs> uh, the Hubble Space Telescope showed us that. Uh, it was confidently predicted that it would take a very long time for galaxies to grow, and therefore the Hubble would be able to see the start, the, the first galaxies that would happen. Well, that was wrong. What actually the Hubble showed us eventually was they happened very quickly, at least some of them did, uh, within a few hundred million years of the bang. So on the other right half, we have the other questions. How are stars born? Well, I was a college student. We knew how that happened. Um, it happened in dark clouds. Uh, gravity pulled gas together, uh, and stars would be born inside. Uh, but it's been this extremely difficult uh, thing to check because why? Because it happens in dark clouds, where the dust completely absorbs all the light you wanted to see that would give you the story. So we really still do not know how the stars are born, although the general idea has to be right. Gravity operating on clouds of dust will pull them and gas will pull them together. How were the planets formed? Well, in 1985, we didn't know at all. Um, we thought the solar system was the only one. Uh, we guessed there might be many, but this was more a matter of guess than uh, understanding. Um, and now we know, uh, as of this year, that there are as many planets as there are stars. And a lot of stars the size of the sun and smaller have many planets. So um, at least now we have a whole different bit of information about how our planets form because we know we have to explain why there are a lot of them. How did life start? We're not there yet. Um, we don't know how it started here. Uh, we don't know whether it started anywhere else, um, but we know it did start here. Um, and I think I have a few things to tell you about that later. How, let's see, how do stars die? Uh, well, we certainly knew that they did die because you calculate what happens and the fuel will be used up after a while. So some will explode, uh, though it's been well known for a long time. Uh, some will just peter out. Uh, some, like the sun, are predicted to first expand to a very large size and then to shrink down to the very small size at the end. Uh, it is calculated back in 1985 that black holes could exist. Now we know from the Hubble observations that they do indeed, and that there is a big one in every galaxy, very nearly every galaxy. So we don't honestly know how that happened. We have a lot of stories to tell, but none of them have proven, as far as I can tell. So uh, looking back also, um, 
I like to surprise people because every morning when you look in the mirror, you can think of yourself as a cosmologist. Not a cos cosmetologist, a cosmologist. <laughs> <laughs> because you are looking at material that has been elsewhere. The atoms in your body were manufactured uh, by nuclear reactions in stars that blew, it, blew up and it sent their material back out. And it not only blew up, but sent the material possibly all the way out of a galaxy that would then fall back in. So our atoms have been recycled numerous times. Uh, probably maybe even a thousand different supernovae may have contributed to atoms that made up our solar nebula and became part of our system here. So you might have seen lately that a, a very dear cousin of the sun has been detected. That is to say, a star that has a virtually identical chemical composition to the sun. So the concept is, well, maybe they were born together out of the same cloud, out of the same mix of uh, previously recycled material. So um, that's an amazing possibility that we could actually find another star like our sun that had the same birthplace. So I think this feeds into the general passion that many people have and I share to, I, I want to know my ancestry. What did my ancestors do to get here? And uh, let's look back as far as we can. So what are the ancestors of our sun? So, some can be found. So, uh, of course, uh, this is pretty elementary for most people. You uh, look back in time by looking at things that are far away because you see things as they were when light was sent to us. Uh, so, uh, it's still surprising to people. Most of the general public doesn't get this, mm -hmm. that uh, you look back in time by looking at things far away. Uh, so, this is easy, but it's still not obvious to everyone. Uh, in uh, 1929, uh, we were given the expanding universe. This is Edwin Hubble's picture from his 1929 paper. Um, and all those little dots and circles are galaxies. And what is plotted is how far away are they and what, are they, what is their speed. And so he measured that almost all of them are going away from us at a speed roughly proportional to distance. So this was actually a law that was predicted in, in, by Georges Lemaitre in 1927. Einstein said that couldn't be right. Um, because he knew, um, but it was right. So, uh, means I cannot draw you a picture of the Big Bang. It wasn't, it's a wrong name. Um, and so, <laughs> what really happened? Well, we don't really know what really happened, we're guessing, but we have lots of wonderful stories that are in the news all the time these days. I'm not going to try to go into detail. But I'd like to show you a little bit about the history of the Earth because it bears on the question of what are we going to find with the James Webb Telescope and how, what does it mean to us. So our idea that astronomers have these days is that the early solar system was not the way that it is now. Um, we know its age because we found little grains of material that we can get isotope ages from. So it's a four and a half billion years old, which just by happenstance is very nearly one third of the age of the universe. So we're young youngies, newbies here on this block. Uh, we think that uh, the moon was formed by a collision of a whopper, a uh, Mars-sized object, uh, that uh, maybe 100 million years after the formation of the solar system. Uh, the earliest Earth was probably coolish, although it was probably melted from inside uh, by radioactive heat and the like. Uh, then I'll show you a, a simulation of the early solar system that says it probably was unstable, but even the orbits were unstable. Uh, and that uh, we were bombarded by, by asteroids and comets for hundreds of millions of years. And then this is a really important point. Uh, almost as soon as that bombardment stopped, life appeared here on Earth. So this is our one bit of observational evidence of how long does it take for life to occur. Here it seems, depending on how you count it, it's either right away after the bombardment ended and it could have formed, or it took us uh, 800 million years uh, for conditions to settle down. So we don't know which one of those is the one that governs the formation of life. So I'll have my mirroring movie here, I hope it plays for you. This is an illustration of, uh, of the orbits of the four giant planets along with the orbits of comets and asteroids that are out there in the outer solar system. So this is a simulation. Um, we are not claiming that it's true, but it shows you one thing that could have happened which is, uh, in another couple of hundred million years, it will be unstable. So this is not Isaac Newton's clockwork universe. People were very upset with the clockwork universe because they confused uh, clockwork with determinism and with the question of whether we had free will. But then look at that. Wow. The orbits become unstable. The uh, comets and asteroids are flung everywhere. They strike the Earth, the Moon, Mars, Venus, everything. 
many of them are thrown out of the solar system. Anyway, we have the, the record on the moon that we can quite easily examine, and we have some record here on Earth of what that was like, too, because there are little bits of continents that are about that old, but not much is left that we can study. So that's something to, uh, to test. Are other planets like that? Uh, when we find them, uh, can we look and see, are they like that? So the Webb telescope has that ability, even though we did not know when we first conceived it, that there was anything to look at. So we will show that. So now, uh, uh, jumping ahead a little bit, I want to show you a few things about uh, what got the Nobel Prize for us here at NASA. So in 1989, we flew this, uh, this observatory, it's called the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE, uh, that was um, just about uh, 15 years after the first napkin sketch. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was 28 years old when we first conceived this thing. Wow. So uh, we watched it 15 years later, and darned if it didn't work. Uh, and uh, there's much to tell you about that one, but I'm not going to go into detail. So two things we got. Uh, number one is we measured the heat of the Big Bang. Uh, this is the spectrum to show you how bright is the cosmic heat at each different frequency. Uh, and so the smooth curve is the prediction that the Big Bang Theory, or I should call it the Expanding Universe Theory, gives us. And you see all the little boxes are on the curve. And uh, I see most of you are too young to have been at the meeting. Um, <laughs> but when this uh, chart was shown, we got a standing ovation for it. Uh, because this uh, resolved uh, the fact that uh, we had a lot of bad observations before this, which were incompatible with the idea of the Expanding Universe. There was just no way uh, we could have explained that, and although people did. We had bad theory to go bad with that data. So, got a standing ovation for that one. Two years later, uh, we showed this uh, map of the sky. The lower right-hand corner shows you our map of the sky. Uh, this was the first time that we've been able to detect that the cosmos has hot and cold spots in the Big Bang material, in the early material. Hot and cold spots you might not care about. But the, what we do care about is that there are also some regions are less dense and some regions are more dense. So uh, what turns out the uh, the uh, more dense regions are able to have the materials uh, pull back on itself during the expansion and turn around and fall back in and make galaxies and stars. So because those things have spots, we're now able to explain by basic gravity how come we're here. So we have measured the beginning. We've measured the initial conditions of the early universe. And if you know it and do it well, you should be able to take a map like that, uh, make some basic assumptions about the physics that the government uh, put in all the physics you know about, you should be able to calculate how galaxies and stars should form from that primordial material. And darn if it doesn't work. Now it works, but it's been a long time. So um, anyway, that's uh, what gave us the basic idea of how the universe should be working. Uh, and let me comment two things about that map. Uh, number one, to make the explanation work, we need cosmic dark matter, uh, which had never, has never been seen in any laboratory that I know of. Uh, we have about five different ways to prove that it exists because of the gravitational forces that it makes. Uh, and we also need the cosmic dark energy, which is also seen only by astronomers, but is necessary to explain these spots, as well as many other things that got uh, a prize for the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011. Here was that? I think so. Anyway, uh, so now I want to show you what are we doing uh, the Webb Telescope for? Uh, why are we doing it differently from the Hubble Telescope? And uh, what's special about the infrared? So, um, number one thing that started us off thinking was, well, Hubble told us that the um, early galaxies were formed out of its reach. Hubble was not big enough and did not have enough infrared coverage to see the first stars and galaxies being born. Uh, so, um, and that's because the expanding universe stretches out the starlight uh, and starts off as visible light and makes it infrared. So uh, that means you can't tell, cannot detect it with the Hubble. So even though it's in space, uh, that's the problem. So, um, and also, now what do we need to do about it? Well, infrared uh, does not come through the atmosphere of the Earth very well. The telescope glows and emits its own infrared light. So you're going to have to have a very different telescope in space to be able to make progress on this. Finally, um, the universe looks different if you use infrared. You just get different scientific results. Uh, and in particular, you're able to see inside dust clouds uh, where stars are being born. So which leads us to the design of the observatory. Here it is. Um, I guess you've all seen this picture probably many times. 
Um, we could talk about why it looks like that a little bit. Um, so uh, I guess you know it's an international partnership uh, of Europe and Canada with the United States. Our prime contractor is Northrop Grumman. Most of their uh, lab work is in uh, Redondo Beach, just near LA Airport, so we visit them a lot. <laughs> Um, but the instruments actually come from all around the world. Uh, one from uh, Arizona with uh, support from California, uh, one from uh, Europe, um, one from a partnership of Europe and Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and one from Canada. Uh, and by the way, the wall being operated by the Hubble is from Baltimore. So that telescope is huge. It is six and a half meters, about 21 feet across, which is roughly floor to ceiling in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, way bigger than uh, anything we've ever had in space before. So, and I guess you know it's going up on a European rocket and it's doing that because that's part of the partnership deal. They're buying the rocket. And that was not easy to accomplish uh, in negoti negotiating that arrangement. Anyway, that means when we're done building it, we put it on a boat and send it to their <coughs> site, which is in French Guiana uh, on the coast of South America. And we are planning on October 2018 as the launch time. So uh, this is what it looks like. Um, side view, folded view, and deep in space. Uh, one, and, one and a half million kilometers out, about a million miles. Uh, and by the way, we avoid the shadow of the Earth. Uh, we need solar power. So we do not want to be in the shadow of the Earth, even though the L2 point is right there at the end of the Earth's shadow. Uh, so. Um, Anyway, um, you see how it is, and we can go into the engineering details if you want later. So, you've all seen the movie, maybe I should show it anyway to comment on it. Uh, the first thing that we do after we launch is we unfold the solar panels. We need, we need juice. We have a battery, but it only lasts for a little while. Then we unfold the parabolic dish that sends the data back to Earth. Now we unfold the, uh, the panels that carry the big umbrella. Steps two and three. And, th and this truly is an engineering marvel to do this. Uh, it, uh, the uh, panels themselves occupy a, a huge laboratory at the Northrop Grumman facility. So here we're unrolling the plastic covers over the panels. They need to be kept clean. <coughs> this is all done by remote control. It happens uh, over the first two weeks after launch. And you can see the edges of the accordion pleated plastic layers there. Um, they are accordion pleated so that they will be completely controlled during launch. You don't want to just send up a bunch of plastic and have it turn into a balloon. <laughs> so that's why it's done that way. Now the last step here on them is we pull on the cords and separate the five layers of the sun shield so that it's the best possible sun shield we can have. So hundreds of kilowatts of solar power fall on the sunshine, sun side and only a few milliwatts come through to the dark side. So the telescope is actually in the dark during operation and so, it's, and so it cools itself off by radiating its heat to outer space and it comes down to a very low temperature of about 40, 45 degrees Kelvin. And it does that so that it won't emit heat. So, so it won't emit infrared like the stuff we're trying to measure. So there it is. Um, this is our version of the seven minutes of terror. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, one more. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> we do have something they didn't have. Uh, they were out of uh, communication with the Mars lander, and they just had to have faith that they'd done their job well. Uh, we actually can check up as we do it. Uh, we are in communication. We can see if every step worked, and if it didn't, we send the command again. And by the way, to make sure that it works, we have two of everything. Uh, two, mo two windings on every motor, two uh, actuations on every actuator, so that's what we have to do uh, in addition to practice, practice, practice. So um, we are putting the observatory a million miles out in space. This is where it goes, at the Lagrange point L2. Uh, we orbit around that, and we named it after Lagrange even though Leonard Euler found it first in 1750 with a pencil. Here are picture, here's a picture of six of our big hexagons. Um, they're all here, by the way, now. These are the big hexagons, the 18 of them make up the primary mirror. Uh, and here they are in their test facility in uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Uh, they are coated with gold to make them the best infrared reflector, but they're made of beryllium. Uh, 
which is chosen because when it shrinks down, it uh, is stable and it has the right, does not change its shape after it's cold. So, um, of course, this, this was part of the test to make sure that they would be the right shape when they are cold. When we get done here at Goddard, we are dragging the telescope through the truck block and out around the beltway to Andrews Air Force Base. We will fly it to Texas, unfold it again back down there, and erect it in the giant vacuum tank in Texas, uh, which is the same one that was used by the Apollo astronauts to practice getting out onto the surface of the moon. Uh, we have now put in refrigeration facilities so that this entire thing can get down to the necessary temperature. And there you see the telescope at the bottom looking up at the test equipment at the top. So it's finished. This, this uh, test tank has been updated and prepared for operations, and it's ready for us. So I'll show you a few things that we might get to see, um, and some things that we can't. Uh, here is something that's in our future, and we know this is happening for some reasons, but that's the Andromeda Nebula coming at us. And you probably know it's coming at us in about two billion years uh, for a nearly head-on collision. Uh, we know it's head-on because the Hubble telescope measured whether it's moving sideways or not, and it's not. <laughs> so this is constant bearing expected collision. So uh, this uh, collision that you is illustrated in the simulation actually lasts for hundreds and millions of years and even billions, uh, and we do not know the fate of the solar system. But it's pretty likely that the Earth, if it's still here at the time, will stay with the Sun. What's less, less certain is, are we expelled into outer stellar intergalactic space, or are we drawn into the merged into the galaxy in the middle? So uh, future astronomers will have a jolly time. Now we cannot tell whether this is exactly what's going to happen, but we look at other galaxies and we see many of them are doing this, or have done this, and uh, we see them uh, in the process. We will look up close to home. Um, this is a place that's very famous, the Eagle Nebula, where stars are being born today. Uh, this is the Hubble picture. If you take the same picture from the ground using infrared, you get this. It's pretty different. So we see through the dust grains, or I should say the light waves will go around the dust grains without hitting, and so we're able to see inside and learn about that formation. So several stars per year are being born in our Milky Way galaxy, and some of them are fairly close. Uh, with some kind of luck, we might even see one of them turn on near to us. So uh, that will be a special event. Uh, we also hope to see that happening and to see if stars that are being born have planets being born with them. And so that's a very hot topic for research with every telescope we have. I guess you know that we're going to be hunting for planets. Uh, 1995, when we started our study, nobody knew that there were many to look at. And this is what the Kepler mission does. You wait. The Kepler mission watches roughly 100,000 stars, and they wait for this to happen when the planet goes in front. Um, the Spitzer Observatory is able to do the other <coughs> one. You uh, watch the star and see the planet going behind the star, and uh, then uh, if the planet is bright enough, you can see the whole combination get fainter when the planet goes behind the star. So now you can tell which light came from the planet, which came from the star, on the left-hand side, of course, some of the starlight went through the planetary atmosphere on its way to the telescope, so if you're really good at this, you can analyze the composition of another planet from here by studying that light. So that's what the James Webb Telescope will be doing for that. Now, we didn't know that this was going to be possible when we conceived the observatory, um, but it is. So we are really working hard to figure out how to do that. It's one of the most difficult observations that you could possibly make, uh, but I think we're going to have good luck, and we'll be able to tell you. So uh, with this technique, we think that if somebody says, here's a nearby star with a good sort of Earth-like planet around it, uh, we'll be able to tell you if it has enough water to have an ocean. And uh, I don't think we're going to necessarily be able to tell you if it has continents, because then you have to have even more information than that. So that's for our next generation of observatory after this one. So um, there's a lot more you can tell, a lot more you can know. Uh, and you've all seen the, uh, the, the uh, JWST website. There's also one about cosmology that was set up. It's called Lambda. That's set up for the WMAP mission and all the cosmology missions that we have. <coughs> if you want to go to the Nobel Prize website, they have uh, detailed uh, scientific explanations for the public of uh, what's been done in all the Nobel Prizes. And of course, we missed my little paperback book, which is still available from Amazon. So I think that's the sort of short version of 
Uh, what I wanted to tell you about, and I think maybe we have some time for questions yeah, and things. Yeah, we have time for questions. Okay, so uh, have questions. Um, a small enough room, I think I can just hear you. So raise your hand. Yeah, okay, there in the front. Okay. Um, will you have a chance to look at the magnetospheres of other planets? I don't know how much. Oh, can we look at the magnetospheres of other planets? Well, we'll look at the planets, but uh, we don't know that we're going to see much. Right. Uh, right. Well, we do know um, that oh, Jupiter and Saturn have auroras, yeah. where the, the uh, energetic particles hit the atmosphere. So um, I'm not sure what we should yeah. see. I mean, I was even thinking of our, our solar That's system. a good question. Uh, yeah. We certainly expect everybody to try. Right. Um, if you have an idea, or if your friends that are professional astronomers have the idea, they should like, write their proposal and say, we want to look at the magnetosphere effect on Jupiter or whatever, and this is why we think we should be able to see something, and then if they are chosen, they'll get to do that. That's how they all have to do it. If people write a competitive proposal, we send it to a committee, of course. The committee has an opinion, and somebody decides that team or another team will get some time. I know Peck was looking at other things, so I didn't know that would be an added piece to yeah, the um, exoplanets. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah um, thanks. Well, I don't think we can, if you're talking about exoplanets, I don't think we'd see, we can see the magnetosphere right, right. Uh, But we could probably see effects of on Jupiter and Saturn and the planets right. in the solar system. I think people have to think that through. Yeah. Okay, question. What would be the biggest uh, discovery JWST could make, in your opinion? Oh, well, everybody asked me that question. Uh, 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 what are you going to find that you don't know about? Um, I would love to find out that there was some new kind of galaxy that nobody had ever been able to see. Um, and there's a possibility for that, because um, the early universe could have had some galaxy that formed and then disappeared, where uh, there would be no modern trace of it. And, you know, all, all of those little bits could have been absorbed into big galaxies, and we'd never know. So uh, another possibility is we'd find out how black holes really work. Um, where did the first ones come from? How did they grow to be big enough to be a million times the mass of the sun, or a billion? Some of them are a billion times the mass of the sun, and they're sitting down there in the, in the middle of some galaxy. They ate something to get there. Who fell in? I don't know. <laughs> we don't know how that happened. Something did. So it seems unlikely that they were born that way. So um, anyway, that, those are two of the three of the big mysteries. And uh, I think it would be pretty cool if we can find that an Earth-like planet has an ocean. Uh, that would be a nice surprise, and we don't know if they're there. This is a, a big question, and it affects our future um, of astronomy. Because if they, if they do find some, and that gives us extra impulse to say, well, let's big that, build that next telescope that's even bigger and able to study the planets directly. Can I have a follow-on? You said that twice now, the next telescope. What do you envision to be uh, the successor uh, to JWST? Wow, uh, we oh. are, we're arguing about it. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? We argue. So what we have to do is predict what we should be able to see and then see how big a telescope does it take. So uh, we think that if you had uh, something about 15 or 20 meters in size, which is two or three times as big as the Hubble, oh, as the web, um, and you had the right equipment, you would be able to study maybe 50 or 100 Earth-like planets directly. And that would be enough so you maybe have a good chance of finding life on some of them. So that would be really cool. But it's a, this is a huge engineering challenge. It requires a different way of thinking. Uh, and because we don't imagine the public will be uh, 10 times more generous, that we have to find a way to do it for the roughly the same price or less than the web telescope requires. So that's the big engineering challenge to go with the science challenge. Right in the back. Uh, yes. Well, first of all, it's just it's a pleasure to hear you speak in person. And uh, I guess my, my question is not really related to JWST, but uh, as a physics student, uh, your 2006 paper on uh, the Dark Energy Task Force, do you think in my lifetime we'll have the technological advantage to detect dark matter and maybe understand more about dark energy and how, mm -hmm. it, how it's key to the cosmic Okay, technology? good question. So. Um, Will we know more about dark energy? That's probably one of the hardest problems. Uh, we have in mind, uh, the Europeans are building a mission called Euclid, and the Americans are planning a mission called W first or AFTA, uh, both of which are going to measure it better, uh, this dark energy. But after you measure it, you still don't know what it is. Uh, we have a hope of laboratory experiments on the ground that would find dark matter doing something. And uh, lots of um, Universities and teams are building these things all around the world, trying to see something happen. So if you're really lucky and you build the right detectors, 
particle will come in, and it'll do something in the middle of your detector, and you'll see a flash or something, and you'll say, dark matter. Uh, nothing else could explain it. And then we'll argue about that, because uh, that's what we do. Uh, because such a detection would be fantastically important. Uh, this is the big missing piece of all the particle physics. Now, we've got the Hadron Collider, and it's now made this systematic explanation of uh, 16 particles plus the Higgs boson. And that fits everything that we see except dark matter. Nobody knows where the dark matter fits in that picture. So, and nobody knows whether you should get at it with an experiment on, at the Hadron Collider, or with a big tank of liquid in the, in the underground mine, or what you're supposed to do. So there's a very active thing. I think we'll make a lot of progress on that one in our lifetime. Even my lifetime. Thank you. So, uh, but dark energy, it could just be a feature. Maybe it's not a bug, it's a feature. I don't know. So let's take so, one more question. One more question? And then you'll have to okay, ask um, questions later. Way on the far side there, sir. Thank you. Um, there have been four manned repair missions to Hubble. Five if you count three as being actually two repair mm -hmm. missions. Um, there aren't going to be any possible repair missions to JWST. I wonder if that worries you. Uh, of course. <laughs> uh, that was our first question. Our very first question when we started off in 1995, what are we going to do? Uh, because it's a big, complicated thing we're trying to build. And uh, we got forced into it in the sense that the only way you can get the telescope to work is to put it out a million miles out. And so um, there was no hope of uh, servicing in those days. There, there is now, actually. Um, I don't know if we're going to... Have we taken them on a tour or anything? Yes, they will be on uh, there, there's a clean tent where they used to be a few weeks ago testing robotic surfacing. Oh. So um, I don't think it's going to be ready for the web telescope and I don't think it's going to be needed. So our job is to make sure that it's not needed. Um, it's logically possible but extremely difficult. And so um, our job is to make sure it works. So nothing in the web telescope was designed to be serviced. So it would take a lot to get there and a lot to service it. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, John. Oh, thank you.